I think we really need to take seriously the offer, the office of ruling elder, the office of rule and the function of it. If you take that seriously, what, what these men have been gifted by God to do, called by the church to do, is to, to govern, to rule the church uh, under the headship of Christ and in accord with Christ's word and uh, the government uh, that he expresses in and through that word and all of those principles. So I find it rather peculiar to think that you know, that we would all of a sudden think, well, these ruling elders, it's okay to have a handful of them around, you know, maybe they could be our treasurer or something, but, the, but, you know, we don't, we don't, you know, let's, let's let the real work of the church fall upon those experts, the theological experts, the pastors. That's a, that's a, just a dangerous way to start thinking. And, and to all of a sudden think that if we want to increase ruling elders to come rightfully, if the church allows, if the polity of the PCA allows for any ordained elder in their in their terms, you know, ruling or teaching elder to come and to participate, and it isn't unfair to encourage or to assist people to come, is it not? They've been ordained to this service, to this office. Shouldn't they not express the gifts and the opportunities they have? I know things are different because it's open to anyone. And uh, that's maybe a question I would have for you, Brad. How do you how might you respond to charges of stacking or unfairness? I, I should ask maybe a, a more pointed question. How then does more in the PCA entertain applications? Uh, and, and have you had any uh, any uh, city el- <laughs> progressive city elders trying to use up your funds somehow? How does this well, work? I would first say on the fairness issue and the stacking issue, yeah. you know, the sports analogy would say would be to point at the scoreboard. Yeah, um, the numbers are what they are, and we're still in a you know we're still sort of outnumbered. I don't want to you know that that sounds sounds uh, negative, but we're just outnumbered at least three to one. And there's uh, a whole other have, issue uh, under the surface here. I don't want to take us down this road too much, but the the matter of committee membership too. There's been organized efforts to stack, so to speak, or the membership and committees to help influence the the uh, trajectory of the General Assembly. That's another related issue. Yeah, we alluded to that mm-hmm. early, earlier. Earlier, yeah. there have been organized efforts to, yes. to to make things happen. And like I told you, I mean, conservatives and confessionals talk to each other, but <laughs> there's just not. Uh, you know, I can I can put my hand on something and affirm that there's no. Uh, there's no similar organization uh, on on this other side of the of the PCA, but I would say that you know the, the first year that more in the PCA was around, we helped five people or something like that, and then we helped fifteen or twenty, and then we helped about fifty last year, most of whom were ruling elders. Those aren't huge numbers, um, but I think what we have done, we've made it safe to talk about this issue. And I think we motivated a lot more people than we helped get there. You know, um, I think that was I think that was important. We're talking about it now, yeah, and uh, that's helpful. Yes. But uh, I'll say this: uh, you know, some some guys on the other side, um, again, who are who are not liberals, uh, they're a different kind of Presbyterian. Or sometimes I say it's, you know, this. I'm sure no one would like this on the other side, but I say it's sort of Presbyterians versus evangelicals. Um, in Machen's day, mm-hmm. it was Christians versus non-Christians, mm-hmm. right? That's not what that's not what's going on here. It's two different ways of looking at the church and the mission. I don't even say there's two different ways of looking at the gospel. It's two different ways of looking at the church and her mission. Um, but more, you know, more in the PCA. If if we're we're we have a small board that are all ruling elders. Uh, if we know someone. Uh, we're likely to just, you know, if we if we know someone, we're going to fund them. If we uh, know and, and trust that they're uh, that they have a need and that they uh, are concerned about the PCA, um, we don't have a litmus test. We've never told anyone how to vote. We don't have a questionnaire. If we don't know someone so well, we talk to them. Uh, but I tell people it's the same way. Uh, if if your church was going to support a missionary. You would want a missionary that generally aligns with your your uh, I hate this term philosophy of ministry, uh, your priorities, uh, and that's all that's in play here. Yeah. If you have if you have a limited number of res- resources, you support the people who you think will do the best job and who have the greatest need. So you know I'm sure uh, the average church is, is contacted by 50 different missionaries 
every year looking for support, but you don't support everyone. You support the people who uh, you uh, who ag- agree with your assessment of, uh, of, of of the gospel, of the situation, of, of uh, philosophy of ministry, uh, uh, missiology. That's another sure. crazy crazy word. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's just it's just a priorities thing, and uh, and we also try to provide some. Fellowship for ruling elders. We have a we'll have an event in General Assembly where they can get together. I mean, it's lonely. It's, it's not only expensive and time consuming and vacation burning to attend General Assembly. It's also confusing and lonely, uh, and we try to help in that way too. Yeah, that's a hidden side of things. It it can be if you don't have um you know a network of friends or people, and a lot of time the ministers do just through presbytery and um just by virtue of what we do uh, often, you know, have friends that we might've gone to seminary with or friends that we've made over, over the course of years of involvement in general assembly or presbytery. When you go to, when you go to a general assembly, it's in many ways, I don't have a reunion or a homecoming, but if you haven't been there much, or if you're not an animal of this <laughs> type of environment, it can be, it can be alienating. You don't know, even know where to go or what to do. And, and, uh, it can be really tough, especially in the evening when everyone's, you know, connecting with their alumni groups and whatever, uh, affinity organizations and, uh, going out for dinner or whatnot. If you don't have somewhere to go, it does get really lonely. It can be really challenging. So we had a great yeah. time last time. I encourage people to look at the, the more in the PCA with the, the Presbycast episode that was hosted at the, the hospitality room. I had a great time there. Yeah, I want to say I want to say three things very quickly. Um, the involvement in in presbytery and general assembly is very important, but it's not the most important thing that ruling elders do. Sure, taking care of the local flock is you know really that's harder than than showing up at a meeting much more and difficult. voting. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've always served with incredible ruling elders on my session. And I consider every one of them to be better guys than I am. Uh, so the, the 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 most important work of the ruling elder is in the local church, and uh, you know sometimes uh, participating in the higher courts, you know, shouldn't be kind of a cop out or uh, something you do instead of serving in the local church. Uh, and that's the hardest and most important memory uh, uh, ministry of the ruling elder. Um, I'll also say that there are fantastic ruling elders in the General Assembly. Uh, a lot of, you know, uh, people like Mel Duncan and uh, uh, Howie Donahoe, who um, who was the uh, uh, the moderator a couple of years ago. We do we do um, alternate between a ruling elder and teaching elder as our GA moderator. Uh, is every, that just you know, a custom, a, or is that uh, uh, it's baked in? No, it, really. Uh, the, fir- the first moderator was wow. Jack Williamson in 1973. Um, and uh, they even have the privilege to preach, or we say exhort, the following year. A lot of times they'll seed that, but not always. And uh, I've heard some great addresses by ruling elders. Uh, so very capable men. There are a lot of guys on the on the standing judicial commission uh, that are that are uh, admirable. And uh, the debate at General Assembly, even though we're you know a third or fourth of the a fourth of the commissioners or a fifth uh, of the commissioners, uh, depending on the year, uh, the, the debate in our overtures committee, our committees on of commissioners, and the floor debate always features ruling elders. And a lot of times I can't tell whether it's a ruling elder or a teaching elder. Uh, they're very capable, committed, doctrinal, serious men. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's something i uh, I want to say, and I said three things, but I, that's only two. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there, there are some wonderful. Well, I wanted to say my own. I did say three things. My own church yep. has just had a great run of ruling elders and, and ministers who were real uh, principled Presbyterians who taught us what we ought to do. Um, not all ruling elders have that. Uh, they may have a more of a generic evangelical pastor. And they may not even know much about what they're what they're supposed to be doing, and uh, they don't have a motivation to to uh, participate in the higher courts. But I, I've, I've had the, I've had the best, and um, I, I admire I admire the people I serve with and the people all the all the pastors we've had at Oak Ridge have just been uh, wonderful churchmen. Yeah, we're thankful for that. <laughs>